Chris is a Christian preacher in Speaker's Corner. He made a video trying to respond to my video about the five reasons why the Bible is not the word of God. And he attempted to address reason number three by trying to point out that we have the same problems in Islam and Hadith. So inshallah, I'll make sure to refute every single point he'll make and show how weak his arguments are. So without wasting any time, let's watch the clips and come back. Welcome back ladies and gentlemen, in this video I'm going to be continuing a response to a good friend Sifi, Sifi Talk, Sifi Talk, Sifi Talk, I'm going to call, I'm going to call you Sifi, Sifi Talk It's safe talk, and by the way we are definitely not friends So please continue As this guy has been producing a lot of videos, a lot of content Bashing Christianity in the Bible And I want to demonstrate how hypocritical, hypocritical? I want to demonstrate how hypocritical that is because he doesn't understand that these same issues are present in the Quran or the Sunnah to an even higher level, which for the Islamic perspective is an issue because you hold to the view that all the prophets are sinless. First of all, we don't believe the prophets of God are sinless in the way you're trying to claim. Because you hold to the view that all the prophets are sinless. We believe the prophets of God are protected from major sins but not minor sins. The prophets of God are human beings and can make mistakes, but they are infallible in conveying the commands and the message of God Almighty. And a simple example is Prophet Adam السلام, eating from the tree which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instructed him not to eat from. Subhanallah, this is just the basics of Islam and you are getting it wrong. And regarding me making multiple videos about Christianity, let's take a look at your channel. The prophets in Islam, Sheikh can defend and Muhammad. Five reasons this Muslim. Can Muslims marry Christians? Muslim. Muhammad. Islamic. Islam. Muslims. Muslim. Don't act like you're innocent. I'm responding to Christians making videos about Islam like yourself. The only reason I started making these videos is to prove to my brothers and sisters how weak your arguments are and how easy it is to refute them. So try your best. And the irony is, is the more Muslims try to bash Christianity by talking about some of the stories about prophets and how they have done sinful things, they in turn ridicule themselves because the Sunnah in particular says that the prophets did tons of sinful things. What you're not realizing is that there is a difference between a human being making a mistake or sinning and God himself instructing his prophet to do some questionable actions like being naked for three years. You need to show us where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded any of his prophets to do such things. Carry on. And things not worthy of a prophet. Let's take a look. Lies about the prophets of God. The prophets of God are human beings chosen by God Almighty and trusted to convey his message to us. And I want you to imagine the Pope who is revered and respected by Catholic Christians running around naked for three years. Would you think this guy is sane and is trusted to learn anything about God from him? Of course not. And this is exactly what the Bible says about the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah 20 verse 2 to 3. At that time the Lord spoke by Isaiah the son of Amos saying, Go and lose the sackcloth from your waist and take off your sandals from your feet. And he did so, walking naked and barefoot. Then the Lord said, Just as my servant Isaiah has gone stripped and barefoot for three years as a sign and portent against Egypt and Cush, how can a prophet be naked for three years and teach the word of God? Were there no children or women there? This story can't be from God and can't be true. And one of the strangest verses in the Bible is this. Ezekiel 4 verse 12. Eat the food as you would a loaf of barely bread. Bake it in the sight of the people using human excrement for fuel. Using what? Human excrement? But why? Ezekiel 4 verse 13. The Lord said, in this way the people of Israel will eat defiled food among the nations where I will drive them. And Ezekiel was confused and told God that he never had any impure food. Ezekiel 4 verse 14. Then I said, not so sovereign Lord, I have never defiled myself. From my youth until now, I have never eaten anything found dead or torn by wild animals. No impure meat has ever entered my mouth. So did God have mercy on his prophet and abrogated the command to use human excrement as fuel? Of course not. Ezekiel 4 verse 15. 
Very well, he said. I will let you bake your bread over cow dung instead of human excrement. So now it's cow dung and not human excrement. Who in his right mind believes such commands to be from God Almighty? It is very strange to claim this is from God Almighty. It doesn't make any sense. So as you can see, ladies and gentlemen, before I let him try and give excuses to these verses, remember it is God who is commanding Isaiah to stay naked and barefoot for three years according to the Bible. This is not a mistake made by a prophet. So what he has to show us is where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded any of his prophets to do such questionable things. Whether in the Quran or the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Sifi has an issue with the fact that Isaiah was naked. This is evidently not possible. Nope, this is not my issue. My issue is the Bible claiming it was God who commanded Isaiah to stay naked for three years. Don't ignore the fact that it was your God Jesus who commanded Isaiah. Why? Because the prophets would never be disgraced in such a way as to be made to be naked in front of other people. It's just not possible. Clearly this is a sign that the Bible has been corrupted. Alhamdulillah. This is again not my point. My point is that God Almighty commands immorality in the Bible. Instead of trying to bring examples from the Hadith or the Quran, why not explain to us why your God Jesus commanded such immorality? We are all curious. What did God gain from Isaiah being naked for three years? Why was the prophet Isaiah, according to the Bible, humiliated in this manner? Please give us an explanation. Unfortunately, Sifi has not done his homework. And when I say homework, I kind of just mean he hasn't read his own sources. He isn't very familiar with his own religion. For example, we read. Brothers and sisters, be ready. We are going to be refuted. And he'll show us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded similar indecent biblical commands. In Sahih Abu Qari 278. Narrated Abu Huraira. The Prophet said, the people of Bani Israel used to take bath, used to take bath, used to take baths, naked altogether looking at each other the prophet moses used to take a bath alone they said by allah nothing prevents moses from taking a bath with us except that he has a scrotal hernia so once moses went out to take a bath and put his clothes over a stone and then that stone ran away with his clothes hmm yeah i'm starting to notice a problem here moses followed that stone saying my clothes oh stone my clothes oh stone so the people of Bani Israel saw him and said, By Allah, Moses has got no defect in his body. Moses took his clothes and began to beat the stone. He's now beating a stone with his own clothes while naked. Okay. Abu Huraira added, By Allah, there are still six or seven marks present on the stone from that excessive beating. Number one, nowhere did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala command Moses alayhi salam to walk naked in front of the people. Number two, Moses alayhi salam ran away after the stone to get his clothes back, which is something normal to do. Number three, Moses alayhi salam didn't know he would encounter anybody while trying to get his clothes back. Number four, there is nothing in this hadith that decreases in the status of Musa alayhi salam or his honor. Prophet Moses alayhi salam was proven innocent from their accusations because of this encounter. Oh you have believed, be not like those who abused Moses. Then Allah cleared him of what they said and he in the sight of Allah was distinguished. This hadith proved the quality of the morality of Prophet Moses alayhi salam. He refused to be like them. He was secluding himself to take a bath and didn't follow in their footsteps. And by the way, there is a difference between God commanding in his prophet to do something and God allowing something to happen. My argument isn't that the prophets of God can't be seen naked. My argument is that God Almighty will never command his prophets with such nonsensical commands. What he's basically doing is admitting defeat and trying his best to take us with him. Alhamdulillah, we are blessed with the truth and our scriptures are protected from errors and contradictions. But you can't say the same for the Bible. Numbers 23 verse 19. God is not human that you should lie, not a human being that you should change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? So according to the book of Numbers, God doesn't change his mind. 
Exodus 32 verse 14 And the Lord changed his mind about the disaster that he planned to bring on his people. And the same Hebrew word Nacham is used for God changing his mind in both verses. So according to the book of Numbers, God doesn't change his mind. But according to the book of Exodus, God did change his mind. This is a clear cut contradiction, which means the Bible is not the word of God. Then do they not reflect upon the Quran? If it had been from any other than Allah, they would have found within it much contradiction. Okay, but that was Moses, that was Musa, that was one prophet. It's not as if there's going to be any other prophets in Islam who have been running around naked and embarrassing themselves and acting in ways that are shameful and defaming for a prophet, right? Right? Let's take a look. In Sahih al-Bukhari 364, we read, It is disliked to the naked during asalat, the prayers. So I assume that means it's disliked to be naked. Wait, it's only disliked? What, as in like it's just not preferable? <laughs> <laughs> Let me teach you again some basics of Islam. The word disliked here is karahiya in Arabic. And dislike or karahiya in Arabic means prohibition. Like this hadith for example because we are commanded to wear clothes while praying. Oh children of Adam, dress properly whenever you are at worship, eat and drink, but do not waste. Surely he does not like the wasteful. And to prove that something is macro or dislike means haram, let's read this simple verse from the Quran. The violation of any of these commandments is detestable to your Lord. And the word detestable is makruhan in Arabic and means haram. And when Imam Bukhari rahimahullah uses the word makruh, he means haram. That's why when we read the books of the Salaf and they mention makruh, they mean haram. Anyway, narrated Jabir bin Abdullah. While Allah's messenger was carrying stones along with the people of Mecca for the building of the Kaaba, wearing an izzah, a way sheet cover, his uncle Alaba said to him, Oh my nephew, it would be better if you take off your izzah and put it over your shoulders underneath the stones. So he took off his izzah and put it over his shoulders, but he felt unconscious and since then he had never been seen naked. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, there were points in Muhammad's life when he was publicly seen naked by many people. Again, this is a public event. Let me remind you that this is not a command from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is not God Almighty who instructed Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to take off his izar. It was his uncle Al-Abbas radiallahu anhu. And this event was before Islam. It was before Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam became a prophet of God. Let's read the hadith together. Narrated Jabir bin Abdullah, while Allah's messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was carrying stones along with the people of Mecca for the building of the Kaaba wearing an izar waist sheet cover. So this hadith clearly explains that Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was helping the pagan Arabs to build the Kaaba and he was wearing his clothes. And to put it in context, the pagan Arabs used to walk naked around the Kaaba until Islam came and prohibited such action. No pagan is allowed to perform Hajj after this year and no naked person is allowed to perform the Tawaf around the Kaaba. So Islam came to perfect the morality of the people. So let's continue reading the Hadith. His uncle Al-Abbas said to him, Oh my nephew, it would be better if you take off your Izar and put it over your shoulders underneath the stones. First of all, this statement of Al-Abbas radiallahu anh was between him and Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And you can't prove to us that it was in the Kaaba in front of other people. So he took off his Izar and put it over his shoulders, but he fell unconscious and since then he had never been seen naked. Therefore, when Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam took off his Izar, was between him and his uncle. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected him from being seen by others and caused him to fall unconscious. So only his uncle saw him. And without realizing it, you just proved that Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was a true prophet because this was a miracle. Let's simplify this hadith. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was helping in building the Kaaba. When he was with his uncle, he advised him to take off his izar. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam still didn't receive revelation and wasn't sent as a prophet at this time and tried to obey his uncle. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected him by causing him to faint so that he is protected from being exposed to others. So this is my brothers and sisters is a miracle and prove that Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is a true prophet. And if we simply go to islamweb.net, it says, In some other narrations, it is reported that he heard a voice from the sky ordering him to put on his izar, 
lower covering. Al Abbas radiallahu anhu asked him, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what is wrong? Then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, I was forbidden from doing so. Al Abbas radiallahu anhu said, I concealed this matter until Allah showed his prophecy, sent him as a prophet. Again, you fail to prove your point and defend the Bible, where God himself commanded Isaiah to walk naked for three years. But again, how can you believe in the Bible? You know, and I know that it is not preserved. I don't hold to the doctrine of perfect preservation. Christians don't believe that the book came down from the sky and has been untouched since. And the Bible is full of errors and contradictions. Judges 1 verse 19 The Lord was with the men of Judah. They took possession of the hill country, but they were unable to drive the people from the plains because they had chariots fitted with iron. The word for Lord here is Yahweh. So God Almighty according to the Bible failed to drive away the people from the plains because they had chariots fitted with iron. So according to the Bible, God Almighty failed to defeat chariot fitted with iron. I don't know how can you believe such things about God Almighty. This is not the correct description of God Almighty, the creator of the heavens and the earth. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide the Christians back to the truth. And by the way, before I respond to his other claims, let me show you where he got his arguments from. This is the website of Sam Shamon and he mentioned both the hadith of Moses and Muhammad and every single doubt and argument made by him was refuted many times and rest assured we'll still be refuting them inshallah so remember I already know all your arguments before you think of making them in Sahih al Bukhari 2819, we read narrated Abu Huraira. Allah's Messenger said, Once Solomon, son of David, said, By Allah, tonight I will have sexual intercourse with 100 or 99, we're not quite sure, there's of a debate, women, each of whom will give birth to a knight who will fight in Allah's cause. And that, A, if Allah wills, but he did not say, Allah willing. Therefore, only one of those women conceived and gave birth to a half man. By him in whose hands Muhammad's life is, if he had said, Allah willing, he would have begotten sons, all of whom would have been knights striving in Allah's cause. So the son of David, Solomon, according to this hadith, which again is incredibly authentic, it's in the most trusted sources of hadith, he said he was going to have sex with 99 or 100 different women. The plausibility of this is immediately in question, but hey, let's go with it. I don't know what you're talking about. For some reason, Christians sometimes act like atheists when trying to speak against Islam. Are you trying to claim that miracles aren't plausible? What about raising people back to life? I believe this is way more miraculous than sleeping with 100 women. And you have no problem accepting it as a miracle of Jesus salam. But let's read your Bible and see what it has to say about Solomon and women. 1 Kings 11 verse 1 to 3. King Solomon, however, loved many foreign women besides Pharaoh's daughter Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, and Hittites. They were from nations about which the Lord had taught the Israelites, you must not intermarry with them because they will surely turn your hearts after their gods. Nevertheless, Solomon held fast to them in love. He had 700 wives of royal birth and 300 concubines, and his wives led him astray. So according to the Bible, Solomon had 700 wives and 300 concubines. So in total, Solomon according to the Bible had 1000 women. So if you have a problem with having multiple women, start with your own Bible first. And by the way, this hadith he just read is simply teaching us the importance of saying God willing, inshallah. And this verse from the Quran gives us more explanation. And never say of anything, indeed I will do that tomorrow, except when adding, if Allah wills. And remember your Lord when you forget it and say, Perhaps my Lord will guide me to what is nearer than this to right conduct. So Solomon السلام, forgot to say God willing. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala corrected him by not fulfilling his wish of having many strong sons. There is nothing shameful or bad in this hadith. And because he forgets to do that, instead of all these knights of Islam, instead of sons being given to him that would do this, he instead only got a half man half. Actually it doesn't say what the other half is, it just says it's a half man. Maybe, I don't know, but it's just half of a man. 
and all because one of the prophets of Islam forgot to say inshallah. Does that sound humiliating for Solomon? I would say yes, that's very humiliating. According to this Christian, having a child who is handicapped or has some sort of deformities is humiliating. Is this the teaching of your loving God? There is nothing humiliating in this hadith. And we Muslims don't believe that humans with deformities or handicaps are less than. We show them all the respect they deserve like any other human being. I don't think this is the burn you were looking for. Let's go to another one. We read in Sahih Muslim 2841 the following. Allah the exalted and glorious created Adam in his image. Now that sounds very suspiciously like Genesis, but we'll let that slide for now. With his length of 60 cubits. To give context, this is exactly how tall 60 cubits is, roughly around 27 meters. The average human you could say is somewhere around 2 meters, so you're looking at more than 10 times the size of today's average human being. Anyway, going back to the Hadith, and as he created him, he told them to greet that group, and that was a party of angels sitting there, and listen to the response that they gave him before it would form his greeting and that of his offspring. He then went away and said, peace be upon you. They, the angel said, may there be peace upon you and the mercy of Allah. And they made an addition of mercy of Allah. So he who would get into paradise would get in the form of Adam, his length being 60 cubits. Then the people who followed him continued to diminish in size up to this day. In other words, according to this narration, Adam was 27 meters when he was made. And since that time, Humanity has been decreasing in size. Right, okay, so... <laughs> no, like that's... <laughs> no, that's obviously nonsense. Humanity has not been decreasing in size since the time of Adam. Humanity has been increasing in size. We know from science, basic observation. I mean, it's not even, it's not even controversial that a person's diet is one of the largest contributing factors to their size. And we also know according to science that we have a common ancestor with apes. Do you believe in this as well? You can't just pick and choose with scientific theories as you please. Trying to use science to refute Islam as a believer doesn't make any sense because we both believe in things that go against science like miracles, the creation of Adam السلام, and the soul. But again, let's use the same science he loves to respect respond to his claim. According to the Australian Museum, how have we changed since our species first appeared? We have undergone change since our species first evolved. Some changes were universal, whereas others were more regional in effect. The changes apparent in worldwide populations include a decrease in both overall body size and brain size as well as a reduction in jaw and tooth proportions. Regional populations have also evolved different physical and genetic characteristics in response to varying climates and lifestyles. So this article completely refutes your so-called argument that human beings aren't decreasing in size. But as a believer, I do not care what science or scientists have to say. I hear and obey whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say. Science is inferior to the revelation of God according to us Muslims. I don't know about you, but I assume Christians should also put the Bible first. We read in Sahih al-Bukhari 3104, and this is the chapter, The Houses of the Wives of the Prophet, narrated Abdullah. The Prophet stood up and delivered a sermon, and pointing to Aisha's house. Now keep in mind, they add brackets in here to insert words into the text because they are familiar with this hadith, and they don't really like it. So they add a few words, but let's read it without the added words. Please stop pretending to understand our Islamic sources. They didn't add the other few words because they felt like it. They did it for you to not get the wrong idea like you're trying to do because we have other ahadith explaining this hadith. Narrated Abdullah bin Umar, I saw Allah's messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam pointing towards the east saying, Lo, afflictions will verily emerge hence, afflictions will verily emerge hence where the side of the head of Satan appears. This hadith says pointing towards the east and the hadith you mentioned says pointing to Aisha's house which means that the house of Aisha radiallahu anha was also towards the east. So when Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam pointed towards the house of Aisha radiallahu anha he didn't mean her house but only the direction of the east 
that the house of Aisha radiallahu anha happens to be in. And this is also a refutation to our rawafid and the slander of our mother Aisha radiallahu anha, the mother of the believer. If you claim that the fitna is in the house of Aisha radiallahu anha, then you are basically saying it's in the house of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So stop it, repent, and use your brain when trying to speak about Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the best human being to ever walk the earth. Alhamdulillah, I believe I refuted all his failed attempts to use hadith to try and justify the immoral commands instructed by his God in the Bible, like commanding Prophet Isaiah to walk naked for three years to prove a point. We should all agree that God Almighty is one and uniquely one, but believing in the concept of the Trinity and that God became a human being goes against the core belief of monotheism. I invite you to read the Quran for yourselves and learn about the truth. Learn the truth about Jesus alayhi salam. Jesus also declared, Surely Allah is my Lord and your Lord, so worship him alone, this is the straight path. And learn about what true monotheism looks like. Say he is Allah who is one, Allah the eternal refuge. He neither begets, nor is born, nor is there to him any equivalent. And to my brothers and sisters, I hope you enjoyed this video and learn how weak their arguments against Islam are. We should all be grateful for the blessing of Islam, the only true religion from God Almighty. You can also watch this video about another episode of Debunked. And don't forget to subscribe for daily uploads. Thank you for watching. Assalamu alaikum.